so my name is Bailey Campbell. I'm up at Penn State, and I'm going to be talking about this monstrosity. Um, the previous speaker mentioned, yes, we are at a radio conference, and hopefully a lot of people know about beam forming. But if you bear with me, for the lowly undergrad that is watching this on YouTube, maybe some other time in the future, uh, I am going to give a brief bit of background into antenna arrays and beam forming. So what is an antenna array? Well, it's two or more antennas doing something together, right? They can be arranged linearly in a plane, in a circle, on a sphere, conformal to whatever. Um, but primarily, you see a lot of linear, uh, like one-dimensional, two-dimensional configurations of arrays. We're interested in looking at volumetric uh, distributions, um, particularly of like randomly distributed elements in a volume. Um, hard. I'm trying. Uh. Okay, so how do you analyze an antenna array? Well, you just sum all of the electrical fields together, right? The electric fields together. Um, now, if you do this, you can notice that you can make some assumptions, like if all of your element, elements are the same type of element, you can pull that out of your summation and then you do this thing called pattern multiplication, which is where you multiply the element pattern times the array factor, which is that bit on the right side of that equation. And the array factor is purely a function of the geometry of your array. And then if you look in there, that K and the R are just like properties of the wave and the position of those elements. Now, if you introduce a complex weight into this equation, you can do things like beam steering. Um, you can direct your beam into any kind of a direction. And this weight is just a complex number that you apply to each individual element, and you can get it to do cool things like beam steering. Now, if we extend into three dimensions, this is kind of the application that we're looking at, right? Um, if we want to develop a signal model, you can talk about the output of your array, y in this equation, is equal to the weight of each element, that complex number, times the output of each element. Okay? And that output of each element is some signal of interest that you're looking at, times the steering vector, uh, plus the noise at each element, and then plus the response at each element from a bunch of interferers. Uh, now these steering vectors, again, are just properties of the uh, geometry of your array. And so it's some e to the minus jkr term, and that's the phase term based on the like position. Um, and I think that's it. OK, so uh, with this kind of established, you can do fancy math. Uh, and you can do beam forming. You can basically, let's say we have some desired signal, and that is S of T, and then you look at the actual output of your array, that is this weight, some weight times your uh, response from your elements, and then you get the error, and then you can find the mean squared error, this is a term that I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, and that's just the expectation value of the error squared. And then you can take the gradient of this, and then going back to early calculus, you can optimize this, set it equal to zero, solve for some terms, and then you end up with this solution where you can find your optimal weights is equal to your autocorrelation matrix times some other stuff. Um, and you can, if you know information about your signal of interest, about your interferers, um, like the direction of your signal, you can do this optimization, calculate your weights, and boom, there you go. You've steered a beam in a direction that you want to. But what about for three dimensions? What if you have a three-dimensional distribution of elements? Well, there's nothing in that um, like set of equations that really like makes a difference. It still works. The math still maths. And so you can, given some distribution of elements, generate your steering vectors, uh, this V of KS term, and then 
you can just plug it in and you can do beam steering. And so this is a example that we did with 32 randomly distributed elements. Uh, this contour plot might look a little weird. You're unwrapping spherical coordinates onto a plane. Um, but you can see that if we have some signal of interest at the green dot, we can steer towards that and then ignore uh, these other two interference sources. Um, this was cool because we're doing it with a three-dimensional randomly distributed um, bunch of elements. Uh, beyond this minimum mean squared error, there are endless uh, different beamforming algorithms, least mean squares, recursive least squares, particle swarm, on and on and on, all these kinds of uh, optimization methods. But this is just an example of doing, um, I think, least squares. Uh, and that is an iterative algorithm, whereas MSE is your, these are the solution, right? And so now we get to this thing. Uh, we call it Medusa for obvious reasons. It looks ridiculous. Um, but this is kind of my PhD project, right? We are trying to develop this system where we can kind of simulate something like swarming UAVs. And then how can we develop different kinds of beamforming algorithms with these like randomly distributed elements um, to do interesting things, beamform, uh, do adaptive nulling, things like this. And so how is it constructed? It's two layers of this thing you see on the left. Uh, we've got two of these analog devices, large SDRs, and then uh, kind of that other diagonal, we've got these like um, modules to do, um, there's an, it, it's on the next slide. First, I'm going to talk about this patch antenna. So this patch antenna is just for demonstration. You could put whatever antenna that you want on the end of it. But uh, these are stacked patch, dual band um, patch antennas. Uh, one frequency is RHCP. The other frequency is LHCP. And so the only reason that we did that is to see what kind of interesting things that we can do with these different polarizations um, and these, these different frequencies. But on the front of it, there's this QR code looking thing. And that's what's called an Aruco tag. And that is able to be utilized in OpenCV, which is a computer vision library. Um, they are designed to be kind of asymmetric. And so using computer vision, each of those tags has like each of those small squares within the big square is kind of a bit. And then using those bits, you can determine the ID of that tag, uh, as well as, because they're asymmetric, the pose of that element. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about this analog module. Uh, it's very simple. It's an LNA going into a phase shifter. There's a typo on the slide. It says it's a 7-bit phase shifter. The attenuator is 7-bit. I don't remember the bit resolution of that phase shifter. But the antenna into the LNA into a phase shifter into the attenuator. Um, and those are all controlled by a teensy. We've got four of these modules. And then we put just a teensy microcontroller just to do, um, we can send commands to that teensy, and then it will set weights after we've done some uh, calibration and then generated a lookup table for all of the kinds of like weights that we want to be able to generate, these phases and these attenuations. Um, and then all together, we've got, yeah, four of those modules. Um, so in total, 32 antennas. And then we're also doing clock distribution so that we can have a synchronized clock across those four SDRs. OK, so more about the Aruco. This is kind of an example of, of how it works. First, we have this step where we do detect markers. And it goes through this image. It finds candidate markers. And then it you know, generates an array of IDs that were detected. It generates the pixel locations of the corners of those markers. And then you can take those corner positions and then knowing some characteristics about your camera, you can plug it into the solve PNP function and it will generate a rotation matrix and a translation matrix. And you can see uh, on the bottom right, we have an example where we're actually able to detect the pose of those markers. These are not the antennas. This is just some thing that I had in my house, um, some printouts that I put on cardboard. So. Um, a lot of fun things that I did was trying to put all of this into GNU radio in an interesting way. Um, I'm sure, I'm going to say this in a gentle way. There's 
a lot of room for potential optimization. That's how I'll say that. So um, basically, things that I tried to do, uh, OpenCV has some functionality to you know, get frames from a webcam and then do this detection and all of this stuff. And so I just tried to take those functions from OpenCV and then put them into GNU Radio. And so here you can see a very simple flow graph to do um, open up a webcam, do this corner detection, and then it shows the image of those corners on one frame, and then it does the pose estimation, and then you can see that on the right side. And it's actually able to, uh, in GNU Radio, at a pretty good frame rate, detect the poses of these um, markers. So back to this background that I was talking about where we have arrays. Um, the antenna output, there's a typo in that formula, bonus points to who can see where the typo is in that. Um, you've got the outputs of each of your elements, then you've got the output of your arrays, the sum of that times some weight, um, and then steering vectors. Why are we using OpenCV? Well, using OpenCV, doing this computer vision, we get this pose information, we can get the position information, and now we can generate those steering vectors to do this kind of like mean, minimum mean squared error um, algorithm as well as some other algorithms that we would like to do in the future. But you can see these are all of the markers on Medusa detected and then displayed in a three-dimensional plot. Both of those are actually in GNU Radio uh, using some of the blocks that I made. Um, but that, I thought that was very interesting. I think PyCute graph is a dependency of GNU Radio, but it's very underutilized. And so I think there's a lot of potential for you know, doing more stuff with PyQ graph, like 3D plots. Um, this, I don't know how difficult this is to see, but just to give some brief overview from left to right. Uh, I've gone through several iterations of doing this like corner detection and then the best ways to kind of get this data back and forth between blocks, what is fastest, um, struggling a little bit. I'm sure I've got many people that can help me make these blocks more optimized. Um, but doing this corner detection with OpenCV, displaying it um, in this like video widget, uh, taking that, passing it to another block to determine the steering vectors, and then passing that into some beam forming block. And what I would like this block to be able to do is just have a drop down and say, well, I want to do MMSE. I want to do LMS or uh, uh, LSE. I want to do different kinds of um, beam forming algorithms. Right now it's just MMSE, but Hopefully, down the line, we can do some interesting things. On the top right, just generating just very like random um, QPSK samples, and then passing that into kind of some like simulation block that emulates like propagation through space, and then hitting these um, elements. But you can see using OpenCV and detecting these Ruko markers on the left side, passing that into the beam former. Um, and then having that determine the weights, sending that into the simulation block, and then plotting the array factor from that. I was able to generate this. This is a tiny little movie. It's like a minute long. I don't know if we can play that. Yeah. And so you can see on the right side is the um, contour map contra plot of the array factor. And so you can see as I move this signal of interest, you can see the weights adapting to kind of point towards that signal of interest. Um, it's not very fast. Like I said, there's a lot of room for optimization. But I thought it was interesting seeing uh, before it has a chance to update the weights, you can see the impact on the constellation. And you can see how it kind of like hits a null and all these samples go away. And then once it's able to recalculate it, it um, corrects itself. Um, yeah, this is just showing some steering of, of the SLI and then the interfere and seeing how it adapts to that, which I thought was pretty neat. Some other things that I would like to do that I have done a little bit of work on is previously, I know uh, GRIIO was brought into Upstream a little bit ago. Um, there are blocks for the FM comms 2, the Pluto, I think that's about it. Um, but because we're using these ADRV 9009s, I'd like to have a block for those to do as a source and a sync in GNU Radio. And so I did fork 
GNU Radio. I would like to do a pull request soon. I'm not just going to leave it hanging. Um, but I was able to just like get samples in and out of the um, that radio. And so this is just a demonstration of doing like getting samples in and out of this radio. Other work that I would like to do, um, I need to validate and test those little analog modules to actually generate those lookup tables that I was talking about. Uh, I would like to do a full over the air test. This test that I showed was just showing the array factor based on the positions of those elements. There wasn't actually any like samples going back and forth and that's kind of the next step that I would like to do is actually generate samples, transmit them over the air, do beamforming, see if I can get some kind of like bit error rate um, generated, do testing like that. Uh, also, I need to do the clock synchronization between those radios. That's another thing that I'm probably going to go talk to Travis about here in a little bit. And then do some additional beamforming algorithms. Not listed on here, but I think there's also a lot of other very cool things that we can do. Now that we've kind of moved into this third dimension, how can we do, how can we utilize the different circular polarizations to do cool things? How can we choose based on knowledge of the pose of these elements if we should turn elements off or on um, to do interesting things? Um, there's another thing that I wanted to mention that I can't think of. I'm sure folks will have questions. Um, if you want to know more about this, you can see me on GitHub there. And then this project is not fully up to date up there because the code's kind of embarrassing and I would like to clean it up a little bit. And so it will be um, at GitHub at this um, location. And I apologize for taking a full 30 minute block when I finish so quickly. But if folks would like to ask a lot of questions, please feel free. I know we have a lot of time for questions. Thank you for a very, very interesting talk. I was very impressed with the uh, ongoing animations of all your beam patterns while you were talking. That was, uh, yeah, next level uh, presentation. I would say, are there any questions? There's uh, one over there. Yeah, you, you go first, please. Yeah, this was a super cool talk. Can you talk more about the drone swarming inspiration? Just, just very interested in drones and yeah, I'm curious I... how that came about. So this is kind of, you saw it's Medusa 2.0. The first iteration was using an Xbox Connect camera. And that like concept of having swarming UAVs with antennas on them, can we make them do interesting things? And that kind of developed into using this as like a, a test bed. If we have swarming UAVs, they're just in some volumetric distribution. How can we like investigate that and do cool things? Well, this is what we came up with. And the first iteration was using a Connect camera with like red, blue, green, and white LEDs on the corners. And that was OK, but then computer vision progressed a lot. And so we're able to do this and get pose information much easier. Um, and so we did the, this second iteration. And then we also have somebody else that, um, not on this project, but on another project, is doing something similar, but using like true time delay units instead of um, these like phase shifters and, and attenuators to get like a wider band um, capability out of it. Is there a follow-up? Yeah, yeah. It's the idea that you're able to focus on like one drone in the swarm. I'm just like, so if you have the swarm of drones and you have these antennas, are you trying to just like isolate one drone in the swarm? Or I guess I'm very curious what you mean by like investigate the swarm. So more like, say we have a swarm of antennas and uh, we, you know, have someone that we want to communicate with over there. Well, how can we make each of these individual drones operate collaboratively to direct energy over here, to null energy over here, things like that. And then I eventually would like to investigate applications to um, space-based communications. If we have just like antennas floating around in space, can we like make them do cool things? I also really enjoyed the talk, thanks. And I'm sure the ADI guys are happy to help you upstream <laughs> the IIO <laughs> improvements. Um, my, I have a question on the location of the antenna. So you said they were randomly distributed, so did you just like twiddle them around? Is there an optimal distribution or does, is it actually sensible to just randomly distribute them and then once you know where they are, you do the math from there? Or is, it, is there also a value in putting them into a certain location to achieve, I don't know, certain beam patterns or anything like that? 
I would think that you can do like more mathematically rigorous like um, beam forming based on like pre-existing knowledge. So like uh, I think this is the thing that I wanted to expand on further work. So we have like um, the pose information of each of these elements. We know they're randomly distributed. Um, when we look at the I talked about pattern multiplication. We've got the element pattern and the array factor. The only reason that we were able to pull out that element pattern is because they're all the same. But if we're in this like three-dimensional case, they're all pointing different directions. So that kind of like breaks that like symmetry. Um, and I think additionally doing like randomly distributed kind of breaks the symmetry symmetry. And so you can't do like these simplifications that you would be able to do um, with a more like um, regular distribution of, of elements. And so I think just our use case, we're really just interested in if we have some random distribution and also looking at that like varying in time. So if we perturb the location of each of those elements randomly, maybe doing some kind of like random walk, uh, how does that affect? Can we like continue to keep up doing beam forming as each of these is just like randomly perturbed? Have you, have you looked at stochastic geometry for that? Like I think that's on in the pipeline of things oh, okay, to, to investigate. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, what about calibration, uh, phase and delay calibration across your um, across your antennas? Is that is that something you adaptively do, or maybe you can say a few words about that? Just calibration of. So right now, the way that we are, are planning to do the um, generate these weights, right? We've got each of these like modules. We're trying to put them in situ and then do measurements and generate a lookup table for each of the like discrete cases that we want. Um, and so each of those cables that are running from those analog modules to the antenna, those are all phase matched cables. And so if we measure kind of from the end of one of those cables all the way through this whole chain, and then iterate through all of the different states hooked up to a VNA, um, and then using that generate um, just a, a table of, well, if I want to set my attenuation to this and I want to set my phase to this, what's the nearest approximation I can do to that? Well, this is in my lookup table. This is the closest thing, so I'm just going to set it to this. Any more questions? Um, hello? Because where? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the synchronization between two different devices, uh, like how do you do it? And in case of, uh, let's say, drones, how do you like synchronize while they are not connected by wire, right? Good question. Um, I'm not sure. I think my advisor might have more ideas about doing this um, with like drones than not being connected. With these SDRs, they actually have a device that does like clock distribution. And so using that, we can do um, clock synchronization. Uh, it's the, in one of my slides, I mentioned it's called the HMC7044, which is another like ADI part. And it just does this like clock distribution. I think it's the JESD2048 uh, framework does this like clock synchronization. So we're going to use that to do this um, thing. I would like to ask a question myself, if I can. Um, so you have a volumetric array of uh, receptors and swarming or whatever, uh, trying to focus on a, on a target. And then I'm assuming the target is going to be relatively nearby. And you end up with curvature of your incoming signal. So you're no longer just beamforming, but you're, tr you're trying to f sort of focus the whole thing. And, and to what extent does the algorithm uh, Handle the fact that the beam is no longer a pl that the incoming signal is no longer a plane wave. I, I I think our assumption is that it's a plane wave, and we haven't really done much to to investigate the case where it's where it's not. We just assume that we're in the far field. Now, what kind of distribution you have that would like violate that? Uh, I don't think we've done a lot of investigation into that. I think that's like an interesting problem, um, especially given this calibration question. Like, how do we, you know, address this? I don't know. Uh, Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, over there. I left too much time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> so just for uh, general information, Thursday, tomorrow, 
um, a student from our group is going to be talking about time synchronization of, of drones. So, so there's that. And I just, I, I was wondering as well. I have you looked at cases where not using all of the antennas may actually provide a better res result than using all of them? I I don't know if that is ever true. That, I'm curious. That is one of the things that we would like to look at. So talking about um, different like distributions, if we make it more regular, can we do interesting things with that? Knowing the positions of all of these and the poses, if the like pose and position are in such a way that they might destructively interfere, can we do kind of like thinning adaptively to improve performance is part of the, the rest of this project. It's very, very cool. And um, yeah, f with the GNU Radio hat on, uh, yes, please do uh, it, let us know about the fork and, and definitely try and get that in. I was going to talk to you about it. Uh, so many things. Excellent. <laughs> I would love to chat. Yeah. I think we have five minutes, but if folks, you know. <laughs> I know. I should. I, I signed up for thirty minutes, and I gave a fifteen-minute talk. It it's not really a question, but we're having such a good conversation <laughs> right now. That, so, um, like, we've already had several questions about wireless synchronization. Are you going to talk about wireless synchronization of of? Yeah, sure, but yeah, no, so now, like, okay, in, in absence of like a ten megahertz and PPS, et cetera, is that is okay? Fair enough. Yeah, cool. That, that's good. I'm just just want to make sure that we get all those people connected. Um, there was a question about that during the Epic Solutions Lightning talk earlier. So, it looks like that's something. Um, yeah, multiple people interested. It was a very interesting problem, and then whether or not to make that like the information generated from the Aruco um, like detection to add that as a tag to those frames or to make it a message uh, was a very difficult problem. And I will say, translating back and forth from uh, PMTs was a lot. Um, I think motivated me kind of making things into. It's like mono block. And I know there's a talk, I think, later about uh, PMTs. So I'd be very interested to hear about the work being done around there. Well, I think it's uh, time to let you off the hook. I would like a big hand for Bailey. Thank you.